So <laughs> happy Father's Day, everybody. That's awesome. That's great. It's great to see you guys. Nice smiling faces and no masks. I'm so glad. Woohoo! Isn't it wonderful? And uh, yeah, it's great. Hey, uh, as we continue to pray, something, and Dan may share a little bit about this at the end with our announcement time, but uh, something for us to consider and think that our leadership's beginning to pray through is that we would, we would, we're considering singing uh, as a church uh, fairly soon, but uh, we really have a decision as a church to make and for us to consider. New York mandate, I don't know if you know this or not, it's kind of a it's a church thing, is that Congre the rules, you know how they're social distancing six feet right now? For churches, if you're singing, it's 12 feet. So uh, they're saying churches, and this is not a suggestion, it's a mandate kind of thing. They're saying churches don't sing unless everybody either has a mask on or is at least 12 feet apart. Or we could go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy those little plexiscreen, plexiglass screens and have a bunch of them throughout the whole building kind of thing, you know? So, and in all seriousness, there's a potential of a fine if, you know, if for some reason the state, you know, comes in and says you guys are totally reckless, irresponsible, and all of that. So, so we're, we're weighing that, and so you're going to probably see a survey later on this week just asking people's opinion. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting some people to be concerned about it, not wanting to do it. I'm expecting some will say, oh, yeah, absolutely. I wish we wouldn't have worried about it and done it already. Uh, but this is one of those decisions that as leaders we're trying to make, but we want your guys' input, and it's, it, together we need to do that. So think about that, consider it. Um, so our, our issue, our worship team would be, we've already talked to them, they're actually okay with it, and I, you probably haven't noticed, but I'm back 12 feet, you know, and we're all back 12 feet. So we're, we're within spec today, uh, if you will, but we're deciding what to do about later on, okay? So consider it, think about, pray about it, and uh, just weigh in. We just want people to be able to kind of speak their, their feelings with that. So anyway, well, take your Bible, if you would, and look with me at 2 Peter. I'm going to share with you just a few minutes this morning. We won't be singing, obviously, today because of all of that, but I want to share with you some uh, encouraging words and, uh, and, and talk to you about how important it is for us to make sure of our salvation. Uh, it's a common thing for followers of Jesus Christ, especially if they are relatively uh, new to the faith, to have doubts about their salvation. It's a common thing, and there, there's a number of reasons for that, a number of sources from that. Uh, sometimes uh, we just are, are wondering, we're so new that we haven't really grown in our faith a whole lot that we haven't really added the knowledge yet, and we haven't walked forward in that and just seen God actively work in our life, that we begin to one day sit back and say, is this really real? Like, how do I know? I didn't get a, I didn't get a salvation certificate in the mail. You know, you have a kid, you get the birth certificate eventually, you, you buy a car, you get the title in the mail, you know, once you pay it off, or, you know, you don't have the deed, you don't have the, you don't get any of that. So how do I know this is really real or not. And sometimes it's just the natural pro progression of our own, you know, our own faith, our own growing. It's part of the reason why I believe the Bible says, you know, add to your, to your faith the, the virtue, but then add to virtue knowledge, because that's what's going to give you the secure, that foundation. Sometimes, honestly, we have an enemy of the soul that attacks us and accuses us and wants us to say, yeah, First time we sin or do something like, yeah, you thought you were a Christian, right? You thought you were never going to do that again. See, that was all a joke. And sometimes he nudges us and hits us when we aren't expecting it and, and puts those doubts and those fears inside of us. Sometimes we're just, we're, we just struggle with all of that. And then sometimes people really believe that they are followers of Christ, and they really aren't. And God the Holy Spirit is nudging them. Yo, dude, like, what are you doing? And sometimes people go through a season of life where maybe they were as a child thought, you know, they had made a profession of faith, they've been baptized, and they go through a season of that, and it's not themselves, it's not the enemy, it's actually a loving God in heaven who's saying, hey, I want you to be mine and coming toward me. So out of all of that, Peter tells us this morning that you and I need to make sure of our salvation. That, that it's something that we need to do, it's something that we can do, and he's writing to, to people like you and I who struggle with those kinds of things. So turn with me, if you would. Second Peter, we're going to look at chapter 1, and look at just a few verses, verse 10 down through verse 15. So read with me, if you would. The Bible says this, Therefore, brothers, he considers them all Christians, he's calling them brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these things, you will never, never fall. 
when Peter is writing to the, the, the early Christians, the early churches there, he says, guys, make with all diligence, make your salvation, make your calling and your election sure. Be, be diligent about that. You see, Peter's telling us that it's our progression in the faith that is more important than our profession of faith. As Christians, so often we will go back and we'll say, well, wait a minute, I know that I'm saved. Back when I was six years old, back when I was 12, back when I was 22, I prayed and I asked the Lord Jesus to save me from our sins. We have a profession of faith. And we share that story whenever we baptize someone. Actually, the baptism is really our profession of faith, by the way. Just the act of baptism is supposed to be that declaration. And we, that's why we baptize, but we also want to tell a little more of the details, right? So what Peter's telling us is, guys, you have a profession of faith, that's great. But really what's important is your progression in the faith. See, look what he says in verse 10. He says this. He says, if you practice these qualities, see that word in verse 10? These qualities, you will never fall. What does he mean by qualities? Well, think back to where we talked last week. When he talked about or earlier on, when he, when he we, remember that list that we talked about, the faith and the virtue and the knowledge and the self-control and all of that? If you look back in verse 8, he says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. P Peter is telling us this. He says, guys, these qualities, that, the qualities are that, that list of things that we talked about that start with faith and end in love. And he says, make sure that these things are part of your life, because if you do, you will never fall. Now, Peter, how are we supposed to make our calling and election sure? He says, if you practice these qualities. You see, the assurance of our salvation comes from practicing these things. What Peter's telling us, they provide for us the objective test, the litmus test of our salvation. Our sense of salvation is very subjective. From our side of things, it's what we perceive, it's what we think, it's what we believe, it's what we feel. It's very subjective, right? And what Peter is giving us is he's giving us a more objective exam by which we look at our life. He says, guys, make sure of that salvation. Because if you're doing these qualities, then that's, you're not going to fall in moral failure. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he says, that's the security of your salvation. These, this progression, this continual spiral in our faith. Remember last week I shared with you guys how, how these things, think about them like a tree. You know, a tree and its strategy will put down early on when, it, when that seed firmly generates, it puts down a root to get some moisture into the soil and begins to put on a stem and then pop out some leaves. And next year, a little more root and a little more trunk of the tree, if you will, and it might even put out a couple of branches and then leaves and just more and more and more that way. What Peter's telling us is that's the assurance and security of our salvation. See, sometimes we doubt our salvation when we're really not growing. And we know we're not growing. And we're kind of blowing God off in life. We're ghosting Him. We're not, we're not spending time with Him. We're not engaging. Or maybe we're just doing it half-heartedly, but we're kind of going through the motions or coasting. And along the way, we're not going to feel very safe because we're not very committed to God. And Peter's telling us, guys, if you continue to grow in these things, if you continue on in these things, you will never fall. So Paul, or Peter, excuse me, is telling us is to make sure that you're growing in this, this spiraling way, adding to your, continue to add to your faith and your virtue and your knowledge and your, your self-control and your endurance and, and all of those things to your, your godliness. Continue forward in that way of life. One other thing that I want you to recognize before I give you the three reasons why we're to continue to make sure of that, this is kind of the foundational piece. But notice how he describes salvation. He doesn't say, make your salvation sure. Hell, we could have. He doesn't say, make sure your faith is sure. Oh, we could have. But he didn't. He said, make your calling and election sure. You see, when we think about our salvation, it's something that happens in the heart of God, that God and the Father in heaven looks down 
And the, the, the three persons of the Trinity each play a different role in that. If you study Ephesians and other books in the New Testament, you'll see that, that God the Father is the one that, that, that He adopts us and he, he chooses and He elects us is what it's talking about here. Jesus Christ the Son is the one who redeems us. He pays the price of our salvation in His blood. The Holy Spirit is the one who, I like to think of it in terms of actuating it. He, he electrifies the circuit. He brings that salvation and makes it real into our soul and brings it into a reality. Those of you that when you surrendered your life to Christ felt something new and, and had that sensation, it's the, it was the Holy Spirit in your life that you experienced in, in your life. Notice that when Peter's talking, he doesn't say, that's, oh, that's one half of the equation. The other part, the piece of it is, is that you and I, hear what all of what God has done, and we simply receive it and believe it. We accept it. We're on the receiving recipient end of it. Those are the, the two parts, if you will, of salvation. It's all of God, but it involves our, our believing. Peter, when he says, make your calling election sure, he doesn't say, hey, make sure you really prayed that prayer one day. He doesn't say, make sure that you've got faith. He doesn't, he's not talking about what you and I do. He says, Make sure of the stuff, the objective part that God has done in your life. If you want to know for sure that God has done all of that and that you really are a child of God, that you really are saved, that you really do have an eternity in front of you in heaven, and you're not just walking through life confused, making things up in your head, make sure of God's side of it. And the only way that you're going to be able to do that is when you are continuing to grow in your relationship, when you are really growing and these qualities are part of your life, He's giving us that growth spiral. See, sometimes as Christians, I notice, maybe not sometimes, most often, we, get, we focus when it comes to assurance of our salvation, we focus on that time where we pray to prayer. Most people can remember that, not everybody. Or we were baptized, we, we focus on that piece. We also will focus on our disciplines of spiritual habits. You know, like, wait a minute, I go, what? I go to church every week, you know, I, I pray and I, I do these things. Of course I'm, I'm saved. I, that's where my... Look at that evidence. Peter could have said those things. He didn't. He didn't say, make your calling action sure by praying. Make your calling action sure by going to church. Make your calling action sure by thinking about the time when you were, you know, whenever you received Christ. He didn't. The other thing that we as Christians, there's kind of three things that we get our little security about in our mind about our salvation. It's our initial profession of faith. It's about our, our habits. And then it's about looking at the sin in our life. You know, we, if we're not careful before we trust Christ, we, we treat God as kind of the center of the scale. And if we have fewer sins uh, than the good things in our life, then we just think we're a good person. We're going to heaven. And we know that that's not how salvation comes. But sometimes after we really trust Christ and really surrender our life to Him, we still view our life that way. Well, I know I'm a Christian because, look, I don't have that much sin in my life. And we almost kind of, you know, measure it out or weigh it out. Come on, like the pharmacist, you know, you go to the pharmacy and they're back there, you know, just counting the little pills and measuring little micrograms or milligrams or whatever, of this and that. And, and, and Peter doesn't say that. He doesn't say, hey, Capture all of the sin and good stuff in your life, and that'll, that's how you'll really know if you're saved or not. He says, no. He says, there's one clear way you make your salvation sure in your life. It's by you adding to your faith, adding to your virtue, adding to your knowledge, adding to your self-control, adding endurance in your life, adding a God-like quality about your life, and growing in love. You see, we, it's our progression in our faith, in the faith, is what matters to God. Now, based on those things, here's three reasons why we should make those things sure in our life. Look what Peter says. He says, for in this way, or he says, for if you practice these things in verse 10, you will never fall. Categorically impossible, never ever will fall. Sean, is he talking about losing your salvation, that as long as you do this good stuff that you won't ever fall from grace, that you got grace when you surrendered your life to Jesus, but you're going to somehow fall out of that? Like driving down the speedboat of life and, you know, just hanging all of a sudden, poof, you know, just like fall out of that? No, that's not what he's talking about. What he means is you will never stumble. 
The idea of falling here is walking through your house at night, you know, and not bothering to turn the light on, and you kick your toe and like, who left that? Oh, that was me. I forgot about that. It's the idea of stumbling. Look in the verse before. We ended this last week. This whole section is so tied together, and it was way too much to do in one week, and we kind of broke it in an artificial spot. But he says, remember verse 9 last week? He says, whoever lacks these qualities nearsighted and they're blind? He's talking about that. He says, look, if you're not growing in each of these areas of your life, and that's, this is the, the pattern and the trajectory of your life, just as a rocket takes off, if that's not the, the general trajectory of, of your life habit, then you're going to stumble morally in your life spiritually. You see, he's talking about in there, as we talked last week, he says, if you forget this stuff, then you've forgotten that you've been saved from your sins, you've been cleansed, that the God of heaven delivered you out of that, and you're going to fall and trip into the muck and mud again, that which God pulled you out of. And so for you and for me, making our salvation sure is not just about living in security in our mind that we can kind of breathe easy, it's not like I remember a time, oh, this was years and years ago. I think Susan and I had been married for, I don't know, less than 10 years. Uh, this January will be our 30th anniversary, so this was probably 20 years ago, I think. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night, and somehow, you know how your brain is like half engaged but not fully engaged when you wake up? And, and it was one of those things, but I woke up immediately thinking, I'm not saved. Oh, no. And I remember waking up and rationalizing and processing, just still not fully engaged, but like terrified and thinking, well, wait a minute, I'm a pastor. Of course I'm saved. Wait, no, that doesn't work. Wait a minute, I graduated seminary. I'm not saved. No, that doesn't work. Wait a minute, Jesus died for me. I believe that's the right answer. Then I got all, you know, finally I was like awake. But somehow in my dream, I was processing, processing those things. What Peter's telling us is that it, it, it's saying is that this security, making sure of our salvation, isn't just that we will live in security and not have doubts. He's saying is that when we live in security and we're firmly sure of that whole, what God's done in our life in the past and where we are today and where we're going in the future, is that we will live morally and righteously before God in heaven, that we won't stumble headlong into sin. Sean, are, are you saying that we will be sinless as we live our life? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that we just won't absolutely trip and fall face first, flat on our face, making a mess of our life, the kind of season or situation that we will look back for the next 20 years and have such deep regrets in our life. He says, guys, if you continue to grow in this way, you'll avoid all of that heartache, all of that headache, all of the shame and guilt that comes after we already know the Lord Jesus. And you'll avoid all of that. Why? Because you're, the security of our salvation is more than a mental exercise. It's more than just a belief. It's a, it's a, it's a reality of our life. It's that God has saved me. And because of that, I'm not only sure of my future in heaven, but I'm sure of my today. And we walk forward growing in that relationship with Him. We move forward with it. That growth is early seen. It's seen the most when we're younger as Christians. You know, I look, Susan and I, uh, I mentioned a couple of trees that we planted, little maple trees in our yard. And they're, I don't know, they're, they're probably as tall as the ceiling now, uh, probably somewhere in that ballpark. But across the road, not more than 50 yards away or so, are two uh, enormous maple trees, uh, sugar maple trees, just enormous. They've, they've got to be 100 years plus. I love it because I love to look at them. I don't have to pay the taxes on them. Every year they look beautiful. I'm like, this is great. I get, you know, something to look at and I don't have to pay for them or take care of them. They're just gorgeous trees. I can't tell you how much those trees are growing right now. They're growing, but probably very, very little. And I can't tell it. I can tell year by year what my trees are growing. When you and I first trust Christ, we see a lot of that growth. And sometimes older Christians are like, well, I don't know that I'm growing that much. And sometimes we even talk about it like, oh, new Christians are so on fire and they forget this and they aren't so much. Can I, can I just be real with you? From where we were when we're lost and we trust Christ, there's a lot of growth. But somewhere over time, it's not that we don't grow as much. You just don't see it because we begin to get, you know, that faith spiral that we've added knowledge and all of these things. And we should continue to grow that. But my goodness, I hope you're not growing as much because that means you're even more of a mess, right? That the difference between where you came from to here should be a lot more 
than from here to where, where you're going. So Peter says, make sure your calling and election sure. Grow in that, and if you do that, you don't ever have to worry about falling flat in your face. You don't have to worry about going, you know, waking up one day and making a mess in your life. You avoid all of that. We're, we live in a season where, I don't know if it's cool for Christians to, I'm thinking popular Christians, rock star Christians, like some in the music industry, but some are just well-known writing books. And all of a sudden you'll hear the headlines, so-and-so is rejecting their faith and doubting their faith and all of these things. Some of those people were never truly believers, followers of Jesus Christ to begin with. They never really surrendered their life. They bought into a behavioral way of life. They brought in, bought into a lifestyle without really truly knowing Jesus. And they finally become on the outside what they really were all, all along on the inside. And then sometimes those people are people that have not been growing. They've not been following that spiral. And their life, because they've not been growing and focusing on that, they've been just doing stuff on the outside, they begin to fall in their faith. So Peter says, you'll avoid all of that if you make your calling and election, your salvation sure, and live in that lifestyle. Two other things quickly, and, I'm, and then I'm done. Second reason we should make it sure, not only does it, does it help us to keep us from falling, but verse 11, Peter says this, he says, in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, when we make our salvation sure in this way and are living that way, that's, our, that's part of our guarantee that we will have a, a rich entrance into heaven, into God's eternal kingdom one day. The Greek Olympians back in the day, whenever you, if a person would go from a town to compete in the Olympic Games, and if they came home a champion, the town would build a whole new entrance for them. And they would come in as a conquering victor, and all the crowds would cheer and all of the glory that goes along. Today, we do the same thing, right? We, instead, we had duck boat parades, you know, much classier and way cooler, I think, than, you know, any of those kinds of things. But when you're a sports team and you're in a city and your team wins, there's always a big parade and there's always a big thing going. It's the same kind of deal. Get the picture, Christian. What he's saying is when you've lived a life and that you've grown that way, when you get to heaven, that there are going to be cheers for you, that you will have a grand entrance into heaven, I don't know if you're an NBA sports fan, but think about the NBA, you know, or any of the leagues. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, come to your feet. And here, introducing Sean Pierce, who's been, lived his life faithfully for our Lord, right? And he's going to do the same for you. It's this grand, incredible entrance that, as a child of God, that we enter into the presence of our Lord. He says, guys, if you live your life this way, that you can have a, a security about you now to live godly for your life. You don't have to wonder, am I going to make it or not? Just focus on that growth spiral. You'll be okay. And because you know you're okay now, you can look forward to that day when you live for all eternity with Him. Third thing, not only do you get a grand entrance in heaven and that you will be forever with the Lord Jesus Christ, but you also can live confidently here today confidently. Look at verse 12. Peter says this. He says, therefore, I intend always to remind you, here's this word again, of these qualities. Peter's kind of fixated on this stuff, right? He's like, guys, I've told you about this, and I've given you all kinds of reasons why you should do this, to make sure you're growing in this way, and I'm going to keep reminding you of this. He says, though you know them, and are establishing the truth that you have. What he's saying is this. He's like, look, guys, I'm not telling you anything new. You're a child of God. You're bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. These things are real in your life. I'm just reminding you what you already know. The Lord Jesus is alive and well. The Holy Spirit is indwelled inside of you. And I'm going to keep reminding you of these truths. See, after a while, when you follow Christ, if you hear anything new in church, something's probably wrong. I had a woman once, I was the first church I was pastoring, and she visited and was a guest one week, and she was kind of complaining about the other church. This was not here. It was actually in Bennington. She was complaining about other churches and said, oh, they just always talk about the gospel and some things. Well, I've heard that. I want to hear something new. And I'm kind of looking. I'm like, lady, like, what's wrong with you? Like, what else do you want? You know, you can go watch Oprah, or you can go watch, you know, 
Dr. Oz or whatever floats your boat, but like that's not going to help you eternity and live your life. Peter says, I'm going to keep reminding you of this stuff because it's what's important. And he says, I think it's right. He's like, yeah, I think this is right. And as long as I'm in this body to stir you up, to wake you up is what he means to kids. It's time to get ready for school. The bus is pulling up. You're late to jolt you into action, to help you to not be just kind of uh, dazed and going through life. He's like, this is important. I'm going to stir you up since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon. He says, I'm about to die as our Lord Jesus Christ made it clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Look what Peter says. He says, guys, I'm going to lay this growth plan for you. Here's your life right here. This is what you need to focus on. And I'm going to keep reminding it to you as long as I'm alive. And I'm going to do it. It's right for me to do because you need to be stirred up like coals in a fire. You're, you, we live our life as, as, as Christians. If we're not careful, we begin to, like a campfire, you know, we can be the hot and the heat, and we begin to dull down, and Peter's like, hey, I'm going to stir those up and release that heat. You need to get moving. And I'm going to keep reminding that you of it so that after I'm dead, you can keep reminding yourself. Do you think Peter, like, it's a big deal for him? He says, guys, this is so important in your life. Get this and do not move beyond it. For real, if you're a list person, one of those inspirational quote persons, you need to write these down, put it someplace, Think through it, pray through it, go through that season of your life and come back to it regularly. But for Peter, I want you to notice subtly, because Peter lived in this way, and he's urging the church, the early Christians to live in this way, it gave Peter confidence about his life. It gave him confidence, not just able to avoid moral failure and all the messes that we can get into when we stop growing and just go through the motions of our Christian life, but it gave him confidence. Here's a guy who says, yeah, I think I'm close to death. He's not worried. He's not terrified. He's not frustrated. He's not grieving, crying the blues. He's, he, he actually has tremendous confidence. He says, I, it's pretty clear that I'm going to put off this body soon. It's coming. He's not, this is not a sad session for Peter. Him thinking about his future he says, I'm, I'm about to depart. I'm about to leave. For you and for me as Christians, our death ultimately, physical death, is simply from us going from this life to the next. It's a beginning more than an ending. I know that's kind of a cool Eastern religious idea, but can I tell you they got it from our Lord Jesus. It's actually a Christian concept that we pass from this. It's not the ending. The world around us sees death as the end. Because for the world around us, this is all they got. But for you and I, we got a whole lot more going on. And for us, it's moving forward into something way better than even today. And Peter says, I'm going to put this body off. That, that literally means a, a tent. It, it's temporary. I love to go camping with my family. And whenever we pitch a tent, we're going to be there a night, maybe two. Like, you know, we're kind of psychotic. I'll go hike miles into the woods and, you know, back in a wilderness area. And we're, we just find a little spot to where we, where we can, can camp and we pitch our tent. It's completely temporary. For Peter, this life for him, he lived always knowing that it was temporary. That his body is temporary. Everything about it is passing through. See, so you and I get into all kinds of problems when we try to make this life more than what it should be. And we're not careful. We subtly still follow the same mindset, the same thought process, the same worldview of the world around us. Our goal in life is not to make the best of this life. Our goal in life is to make the best of the next life and live this way focused on growing before our God and being used of Him. Well, Sean, does that mean we have to live austerely and, and like, you know, like we're in a desert? And like, No, God wants to bless us, yes. But it means that we live in such a way that we have such a confidence in the future that we're not worried about that transition of our life and it keeps everything around us in complete perspective. So guys, as we think about these things this morning, where are you? 
Did you take one of those last week that I challenged you with? Write one down, think about it, pray about it. Maybe you did, and maybe you forgot about it all week long until today. Well, consider that God might be bumping you again to, hey, you really do need to pick that one up and think about it. I get it. I'm real too, right? I know that happens. I, I have those resolutions or ideas. And I'm like, oh, I forgot all about it. It's okay. Think back through that again. Put these down. Make that commitment before God to grow. Maybe you've thought about the security of your salvation as just a mental thing that you know that you know. But it's actually meant to be a moral thing that you actually, as you live in that world, it keeps you before God. And maybe somewhat, sometimes we need to almost let go of just thinking about the sin, and we just focus on this stuff. And that sin stuff begins to just take care of itself because we're too busy focusing here. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe you have been doubting your salvation a lot, and you're not sure what it is. Maybe it really is God. Maybe it's not. But if that's something you're struggling to process, I would be more than happy to pray with you and talk with you about that. Dan would. There would be others as well. It's normal to get to doubt your salvation occasionally, but if it's a consistent thing and pattern of your life, then somewhere along the way you need some help in there. That shouldn't be the everything in life kind of habit. And where are you in terms of these, these three things? Are you living toward the future confidently or are you worried about that? Or can you live looking to that grand future, knowing that you have confidence today? So I don't know how God is speaking in your heart today, but I trust that his word has uh, encouraged you, challenged you. And I'm going to, as I pray, I'm going to just ask that you have a time for yourself to just make your commitment to God. Maybe you need to say thank you to him. Maybe you need to be simply grateful for that salvation. Maybe you need to ask his help. Maybe you need to confess something. I don't know. But whatever it is, would you respond to him today? I can't see your heart, and I'm glad. We can't see each other's hearts, and I'm glad for that. But God sees your heart. So pray to him. Pray with me, would you? Father, I lift every individual here this morning. Thank you for the truths of Peter. Lord, I must confess, I, I, I've just been so astounded by this simple process that Peter laid out. Father, help us to be reminded of these regularly. I will do my best as a pastor to not let us forget these truths. Families should not forget them. Parents should to consider these for their kids. Lord, help us to, to do what Peter challenged the early Christians to do, is to constantly remember these things. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the security of our salvation. And God, for the commitments that are being made and thought about right now, I pray your blessing upon each individual. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.